for giving me an audience. Um, I'm uh, one of the programmers, uh, one of the many programmers who do games on the Acorn uh, My uh, highlights of my career, I would say, was um, Star Five Dead 3000. Uh, you can see running there. Um, so, to start with, I'll um, talk a little bit about my history, I suppose, how I got into games, what, uh, what inspired me. Uh, so, early inspirations, there we go. Um, I was born in uh, 1969, and uh, my earliest inspirations were the arcades. Uh, the arcades back then in the 70s and early 80s, they weren't just fruit machines, they were um, arcade machines. They were mostly arcade machines. They were um, the latest and greatest um, games like um, uh, Star Wars. They, these were the massive inspirations for me. These were incredible. They were they were ahead of their time. You could go to an arcade, you could get your ten pence and uh, or two shillings, and you know, put it in the machine, and, and you'd be playing something that was out of this world. Uh, people take it for granted now. This looks uh, very, very basic. Um, but to see that running, and to not have seen it the year before, was absolutely um, staggering. Um, and from a, an early age, I was just amazed by these machines um, <coughs> that were producing um, experiences, interactive experiences that you, you couldn't imagine. It, it never happened before. Uh, television at the time was you know, fairly okay, um, but these, these machines were um, the thing that I wanted to do. Um, and I suppose one of the things that was in particular was the, um, the 3D side of it. I was always amazed by the, the fact that you could move around in a, a 3D world um, that was, although not real, <laughs> um, but that, that, that freedom of movement, the freedom of movement that the, um, kids nowadays, they take for granted. But this was, this hadn't happened, and then it was happening around me. Um, I, I would go to the arcades every year, and I would see incredible stuff, uh, battle tanks, and, and so on. Imagination took over. It was you were the little 
yellow dot that you can see there, and that was someone just about to take the chalice back into the castle. But it was incredible that you could go in any direction. And this was something that stepped aside from the arcade stuff. The arcade machines were very much geared towards uh, a, a quick 10p, take your 10p and put your 10p in again. Whereas this uh, developed a bit further into entertaining you for longer. They didn't, they weren't getting coins when you played this, so they made it more fun, I, I would say. Um, and one of my greatest early memories of uh, Did you get the other And he was far cooler, and he had, um, he had uh, a record there, and he had, uh, he had a Duran Duran album there. And um, the uh, absolute sticks in my mind memory of playing this game, um, Adventure, whilst listening to Duran Duran Sound of Thunder, and that felt just like you were in the future. Um, this, this, this never existed before. 3D graphics had never existed before. Computers had never existed before, as far as I was aware. They probably had. Um, so education, I suppose, uh, in the wrong order. But um, at school, um, they were doing computer studies. Um, they would teach you how to program uh, rather than use spreadsheets, which is nowadays. Uh, and one of my first programs was uh, something like this, um, and I believe it was written on a Commodore PET. And um, it was to write a program to add two numbers together. And uh, I remember, I don't know whether I impressed or made the teacher smile, but I, I put in a deliberate um, loop that gave the impression that the uh, computer was thinking about the song. <laughs> and back then, all you had to do was a short for next loop, and uh, that would uh, take up many, many seconds of time. Um, on the pet, first machine I probably programmed, and these were the machines that were in the computer labs. There were BBC micros around then, but it was a bit rare. There was there were two BBC micros and many many Commodore pets, uh, and the only really the sort of the chosen ones would get to the RPC micros. And they were almost like the master pros of the of the time. Um, and these are I suppose the GPCs. <laughs> um, I think the you didn't actually have the majority of them, they did have a, a means of storage. And I think some of the uh, more uh, upgraded ones would have a tape machine next to them so you could, you could save your program at the end of the day and reload it later. And I guess that was, yeah, I suppose the business machine at the time. It looked like a business machine. Um, whereas the, the BBC Micro, I suppose, was an educational machine. Um, it was, it was, well, it was an educational machine, you can tell it uh, its target. Um, my first um, machine at home, um, the Spectrum. Now, um, I, I would have preferred to have a BBC Micro, but uh, they were considerably more money. I seem to remember the pricing was a lot, like something like £400 for a BBC Micro, £130 for a Zed Spectrum. Uh, it was, there was no real chance that I would be getting a BBC Micro. Um, my first ZX Spectrum broke and had to be returned. My second one broke again and had to be returned. <laughs> I believe it was only the third one that, that continued working. Um, but this was a, a home machine that you could program on. It instantly introduced you into a programming environment even to load a game on a Spectrum and on a PC micro, you had to type in, load something, something, speech mark, speech mark, and, and press return, and press play on the tape. 
So straight away you were you there was no sticking the cartridge and switch it on. It was um, and and you could then people would sort of show each other, oh, do you know how to draw a circle? And you type in ten circle XYZ and it was introducing you to the idea that it was not just something that you play games on, it was something you controlled. Um, and that, that tickled my imagination. I, I, I started to get interested in it. Um, so on, on, on the ZX Spectrum um, was, I would say, where my interest in programming first started. Um, there were um, 3D graphics at the time, but there was nothing like the earlier things I'd seen in the arcade, the um, Star Wars and the Wars. Battle Zone. Um, and, and they, those games would use um, vector graphics, so they wouldn't actually be calculating the lines themselves. They would be moving the cursor or the raster along the screen, switching it on and off to draw um, the lines. So, they were giving the impression of being far more powerful than perhaps the uh, technology was. Um, so I, I did try and sort of get into programming on the ZX Spectrum as a submitting games to magazines, uh, magazines which uh, pay small sums of money for listings and code that would go into their. Um, their publications, but uh, I didn't think myself be good enough. Um, and I, I, I remember sending off versions of uh, Breakout and, um, and and seeing the link on the um, on the BBC Micro. I of course wanted to replicate that on my ZX Spectrum and had a go. Um, and even you know, I got as far as putting some wireframe graphics using the ZX Spectrum basics, so it wasn't brilliant. Um, but I, I learned a little bit about what you could do. Um, and, um, and that was about it, really. So, um, ended up playing games on it. This was one of the games I played lots and lots and lots. And I played it with a, a friend of mine from school, Tim Carroll, who later I uh, began to work with. Um, but I suppose he was he was a friend down the road. He used to swap um, games cartridges on the Atari and we'd play Bruce Lee on the ZX Spectrum. But he had a BBC Micro, so I got to go around to his house and play Aviator and the real Elite, not the uh, not the bad conversion onto the Spectrum. Uh, and so I got an appreciation of what BBC Micro was, and it was. Uh, a, more powerful machine that you could get straight into and uh, it presented you straight away with a, a, a basic language that could also switch into an assembly language, the, the more powerful way of accessing the full power of the machine. Um, and it was, it was just better. It was a better machine than my lonely spectrum. So, career after school. That's me. As a school leaver, sixth form, did sixth form at school. I was never really an academic. It didn't, didn't quite suit me. I think um, school has maybe uh, inspires people a bit more now, but um, I suppose back then uh, I, it just didn't work out for me. I did stay and uh, do my A levels. Um, my parents really wanted me, they had lined me up for a career in um, engineering um, and I just didn't have the oomph to stick with it. Um, so I didn't get any A level. I ended up at the end of school um, with, um, yeah, I've been playing Spectrum games and, um, and that was it. So, um, time after school, I um, finished my A-levels, failed completely, um, got a job, got, got various jobs. Um, I mean, I suppose I 
having my first real job was selling windows and then the was blazing. <laughs> they liked me because I was slightly posher than some of the other ones, but I just, yeah, I stuck it out for a week or so, it was not for me. Um, eventually got a job at a nice company, worked in a factory as a kind of a, a technician. Um, my actual job title was uh, brick tinter. Um, and I started on two pounds an hour in 1988, so not brilliant, but a job um, and so I did that for about a couple of years and in the back of my mind there was always this idea that oh you know maybe if I um, I these these sort of things I, I Tim went to got uh, Tim my friend uh, he did graduate so uh, he, he uh, did his A levels and then went to university uh, but also you know got an Archimedes and I was always sort of in the area of people who had these, um, uh, I suppose, more ambition, but also more money and had posh, posh people on like these machines. And I would see them, and, and they were amazing. And it just waked up this sort of feeling that, oh, that, that I used to love doing that. Um, I want to do it again. And so after a couple of years, um, I decided, well, I think after a year, actually, I decided I'm going to um, buy one of these Acorn Archimedes. And it was that machine in particular. It was that machine in particular because of this game. Um, at the time, um, PCs were around, uh, I suppose Amigas were around and so on, but nothing could do this. Nothing could do um, solid 3D polygon graphics that moved at a fast range rate and that's exactly what I wanted to learn how to do. Um, so there was just no contest. And I also knew that uh, the Acorn Archimedes was, because it was, I suppose, an educational machine, it was something that you could get into easily as opposed to, say, a PC or something where that wasn't their main drive. They, they wanted to do a machine for different reasons. So. Um, I, uh, there was um, a shop in, I used to live in Derby, um, in the Midlands, and there was a shop there called First Night Computers, and they would mostly have PCs and Windows, and they would just be doing nothing apart from displaying some graph or a spreadsheet or something. And the Acorn Archimedes had a rolling demo that would include uh, a bit of arch and a bit of something else, and, and and rock set that would rotate its colours and so on. And it just, you had to get it. Uh, I had no choice. Um, and so, yeah, I um, managed to get a loan, get myself my first day on Archimedes, um, and started programming. Um, first program was in BASIC, and so were many, many subsequent programs. Um, but I did leap it straight in there and start doing, you know, 3D graphics. I understood before I could remember enough about what I'd learned before on my Z spectrum to understand coordinates and rotations and uh, perspective. Um, and uh, because it was sufficiently powerful, you could just, in, in basic, you could do certain wireframe graphics and they would run fairly smoothly. And that in itself is the inspiration to want to do more graphics and make them run more smoothly. Um, another thing was uh, arcade machines had suddenly stepped up. They were no longer um, uh, wireframe uh, vector graphics. They were solid 3D graphics. And uh, this was a, an arcade machine called Hard Driving uh, by Atari. Um, and I think it was incredible. It was the most amazing thing I'd ever seen. Um, because you had a, you know, a proper steering wheel, proper 3D graphics, good frame rate. Um, and that was the kind of thing that I wanted to reproduce um, on a Acorn Archimedes. Um, so my first games contract, after probably, I think it was, Getting on for about a year and a half, working 
in a factory. Um, I was I would eagerly come home at the end of the day. I would because I, I the place where I worked was very low, it was five minutes to walk away. And um, I'd, I'd race home and I'd get on my Archimedes and I'd try and learn new stuff. Um, and um, yeah, I suppose the sorry, just reading my notes. Um, actually, I was just uh, yeah. The, the first thing I ever paid for um, as a programmer was well, it was on the Archimedes. I mean, I, as I say, I tried to submit some Spectrum games to uh, magazines, and they they weren't interested. Uh, but I did um, a game that was it's very simple 2D biplane game, um, but it used a um, there was a, a basic compiler. That would turn uh, BBC 81 Archimedes BBC Basic into um, slightly faster um, compiled code. Um, and so I did a demo uh, that used this. I must have um, paid for it as well. And um, they, they uh, were quite impressed by it and they gave me £50, which was my first uh, gaming contract. Uh, and so. From then, I, I, I started uh, reading the games magazines. Um, I learned about um, assembly language. I learned that beyond BBC Basic, uh, there was assembly language. And from the magazines, I copied out um, lines of assembly code that um, allowed me to draw lines for particular screen resolutions faster than the, the basic drawing lines and suddenly I, I could draw more lines and I started to understand it and then I bought myself a book on arm assembler um, and understood it further and started to understand how you could make polygon shapes uh, like, like you could see in the uh, arcade machines. Uh, and then eventually I developed a 3D flight sim that was uh, very simplistic, but it did feature a two-player mode where the screen would be split horizontally and on the top and bottom of the screen there would be uh, two different players and those two players would control the game simultaneously on the same computer. Um, and it was, it was okay. And I sent it off to a company called The Fourth Dimension, <laughs> and uh, they said, oh, we, we like that. And uh, they, they gave me a contract. Uh, it was um, a £1,000 in advance of the royalties. Um, and I, I left my job straight away. And uh, <laughs> 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 the full-time, um, I suppose, indie games programmer in 1990. So, <laughs> But uh, this is my first game, um, Fox Away, on the Acorn Archimedes. As I say, it was probably just learning and yearning and two years of, I think, fairly full on work thinking back because I wasn't particularly sociable. I didn't go out much. I really enjoyed going home and um, programming um, and learning how to program. And that's what I did for probably a good year or two, building it up. And then luckily got the uh, incentive for someone um, backing me, uh, which was the fourth mention. Now they were a, a games publisher, but this was in a, an era when games publishers were quite different to what they are now. They, they were two blokes in Sheffield with a, a warehouse um, and some boxed up games and a, a very small kind of business. <coughs> um, drops away, uh, eventually got finished, it took about a year or so um, and uh, it, it did really well. It was kind of released at a very, I think the April market had uh, hit its peak 
um, and started to plateau at this point. But I, I, I did quite well out of it because it was me as an individual. I'd been earning two pounds an hour and then I think I'd gone up to four pounds an hour. But then suddenly, the chops away, I, I was earning 20, 30,000 pounds a year um, for that one development, which I then spun into. Uh, under the direction of uh, the fourth dimension, did sort of sequels and uh, see there it's the, the, the uh, I think it did well for them and for me, um, and they they repackaged it uh, many times. Uh, that's a, uh, I think that's the first or second one maybe. It was extra missions, but there was sort of subsequent releases of it. Um, the first release. It's a little bit uh, clunky, a little bit slow, and then I found ways of optimizing it. And, uh, they released it again and upgraded previous people free, and, and we did some chops away exhibitions and so on. Uh, and uh, it was, yeah, it was good. So the next game they wanted me to do was um, another a plane game, and I, I suggested, oh, Spitfires. We're not in Spitfires yet. <laughs> so uh, it's time to work on a game called Spitfire Fury. But um, I think by this time, um, I've, um, I suppose, uh, missed out a little bit on uh, suppose enjoying my life and people had you know gone to university and they had a bit more of a party life than I had and so I started with my newfound wealth <laughs> started um, enjoying myself a bit more um, and just going out and um, going to clubs going to pubs um, and Spitfire Fury took a little bit of a, a backseat to this <laughs> new lifestyle, and uh, what to mention, eventually, uh, quite rightly, got fed up with me, uh, they, were, <laughs> they were sponsoring me to do this game, they were helping they were helping graphics and giving me advances, and they wouldn't see much return, uh, because I was out having fun, uh, and they, they dropped me, and so it was almost all over, but an old school friend, and uh, lived down the road two minutes away from me and he was the one that, you know, always a bit more wealth than me and he can see my prayer when I was Spectria <laughs> and now Archimedes when I have nothing but <laughs> <laughs> um, and so he was uh, at university, he, did, he, he was a year younger than me and he went to university and his friends were playing chocks away and it was, I was almost a little bit of a, oh, he chocks away, the, the, you know, the, I, I, I was a little bit noted for it, and, um, and he was um, really keen, he, he sent to me, Tim sent to me, uh, let's uh, do a business together, let's, um, he graduated, he got his degree, and, um, I think he had offers at proper, proper job offers, uh, but chose to become a bedroom coder, uh, and so me and Tim formed FedNet. And the first game we decided to do was a game called Stunt Racer 2000, which was very reminiscent of hard driving, um, the Acorn, not the, the Atari um, arcade machine. Um, now the two of us did this, um, and we, we split the workload really well uh, because we were both friends there was no we weren't trying to <coughs> outdo each other or there was no egos it was just uh, a couple of friends doing something together uh, he had a, a Tim had a lot of experience of uh, modern techniques uh, things like linked lists and um, fancy things that I <laughs> never imagined so um, we very quick, quickly um, Decided to um, get the game up and running. Uh, first thing we did was create a serial link um, version, so the two machines that we had, uh, we could race against each other. And that itself was an inspiration. That um, idea that you could uh, develop the game and then play it 
and then develop it further and um, really spurred us on. Um, one thing about the game was that the, the recordings, the, the cars themselves, weren't driven by an AI algorithm, they were driven by the and we would do recordings of ourselves um, racing round, and that's what you would ultimately race against when you played the game, uh, which was a good idea, except um, me and Tim were in, intensely competitive, and we would, <laughs> we would race more and more quickly against each other. So by the time we got to about level five, or track number five, <laughs> The, the cars were ridiculously fast, uh, <laughs> and we, we also had the advantage of a rewind system, so if one or the other of us had a crash, we would simply press spacebar and uh, we would rewind a few seconds. The, the game was, uh, it was difficult because of this, um, difficult to play for the user. Um, but we really enjoyed making it, and we established a, a, a really good relationship doing it. Uh, one of the um, sub-games that um, I think probably went by largely unnoticed was uh, where you just had two cars and you would uh, battle out uh, against each other in a sub-game called Killer, um, where all you had to do was ram the other person off the track. Um, and we loved playing this, and we, we would play it all the time, and we would play it for challenges, for who, who made the coffees, for who uh, went to McDonald's to get a meal, and so on. I would generally lose, but I think I had the odd time for uh, one. Um, it did okay, but um, it, you know, people liked it in the reviews. Um, there was, uh, you know, Still good coverage. The magazines. There were still two magazines there. Um, but I think with, with it being two of us, with it being uh, maybe there was more saturation again. We didn't really do that well out of it. Um, it took about a year to do it. Um, one of the great things, though, because there was two of us, we were doing um, experimental. We would do. We, we would recode the game just for our own benefit, just for our own fun. We would introduce cars that could float, or cars that could go ridiculously fast, or cars that could fire other cars at each other. <laughs> so fun. Um, and that, that was great fun, and I think that was, you know, some good ideas came out of that. Um, uh, we, we started working with other people. Uh, there was a graphic artist who we knew from the pub uh, called Todd, and he helped do some of the uh, artwork, in particular screenshots, the, the loading screens and the sort of mission complete screens, that kind of static artwork. Um, and uh, yeah, we um, another school friend um, helped us with some of the track design because we were suddenly, I think with Tim's uh, expertise, we were doing uh, uh, track editors and uh, things that would allow people without a programming or so much of a technical knowledge to be able to uh, implement game elements. So uh, we're getting people outside of the intent to uh, introduce uh, content uh, through, through the editors that we've written. Um, but ultimately it was, uh, I suppose, a declining market. Oh, yeah, but well, we, we also had, um, we had a, a, sound, uh, a sound designer um, who was, well, not so much a sound designer, but um, he was called uh, Pez. And uh, his uh, Volkswagen Beetle provided the sound of the engines that he recorded on the short loop. And he uh, shouted a checkpoint <laughs> into the microphone, and uh, we put that in there as well. He did put an American image on the checkpoint, though. <laughs> so, uh, after, um, start, uh, after some ways 2000, it didn't do brilliantly, but we decided to stick it out. Um, and we, we thought, well, let's stick with the acorn. We, we know it well, we enjoy doing stuff on it. Um, 
and let's you know really push it and uh, do our own game, publish it ourselves. We decided this right from the start um, that the fourth dimension were good in that they would take care of everything. Um, we would get, I think, a 10% of retail price royalty off them, which would be uh, amazingly, they would sell them for about 25 quid or 30 quid, which probably is a fortune nowadays. Um, so we would get £2.50 or £3, regardless of what they sold it to the distributors. Um, but when the sort of numbers were falling into the sort of low thousands and so on, um, £2.50 split times thousands split two ways wasn't, wasn't significant enough. Um, so uh, we decided we're going to write our own game. Um, we're going to publish it ourselves, uh, we're going to do everything. Um, and so we set about that. And uh, within a reasonably short amount of time, um, we had, so I think we really developed uh, our, our skills by this point. Uh, and we got Starfighter 3000 running as a texturing demo. Um, it was yeah, very highly optimized um, for the Viacon Archimedes. Um, We really didn't have 
a very practical strategy to completing this game. Um, we're coming up with new ideas um, right to the last minute. And um, I, I, I remember the, um, the, the night before, um, well, the, the sort of, yeah, the two months leading up to the Avon Death Act. And we were, we were taking it in turns to, we took over my brother's bedroom. My brother was uh, at the university, and so we made his bedroom our office and sleeping area. And because we couldn't trust each other to go home to sleep, the person who was uh, getting four hours sleep would uh, be on the bed next to the acorn, whilst the other one carried on through the night. And then we would literally limit ourselves to four hours sleep each person, but without the other one sleeping at the same time, just so we could try and push this game out the door. And it would be it's completely ridiculous. <laughs> we weren't inventing new ideas. We weren't sleeping. We were. Uh, we had this deadline of the Acorn World Show. Um, and well, uh, unsurprisingly, there was like a few problems. Uh, one of the things I remember, which was uh, in, in my sort of big bug, which was the the, the hills you can see them there, hill collision detection. You you could crash into those hills, you could fly up to them, crash into them, and it never worked. It never worked until the last few weeks of the development of the game. And by this point, we developed a lot of missions and we tested them as we got along. And so I, I, I developed or thought of a fix to uh, work around problems with the collision detection the hills. But unfortunately, it, it, it increased the sort of the area that they um, spread across the map. And um, many of the uh, mission objectives were subsequently buried by the expanding <laughs> <laughs> hills. And, uh, so, to my shame, some of the very early missions on some of the uh, areas that had been tested and had been working were completely broken by this <laughs> fix that I put in for the, the hills. And um, last night, the last night of um, programming, we eventually we simply ran out of time. We didn't finish it. We ran out of time. And um, so, I had a bank of. I think three or four um, Acorn Archimedes, giant pile of discs and uh, labels, um, and uh, stayed up all night because Tim was uh, Tim was driving, so he got some sleep, and I stayed up all night copying discs in readiness for the Acorn World Show. Um, I felt it was going to go really well, so I copied as many as I could and managed about 500, I believe, um, although. Slightly delirious, <laughs> half of them were black. <laughs> <laughs> Second disc and so on. Um, but we, we, had, we really did some uh, quite cutting edge graphics at the time. Um, the cover art, we, we got um, um, a friend who was an artist who developed the cover art for us. We did all the box ourselves, we did the printing of the manuals. Um, we did the advert ourselves, uh, the advert that went in the magazines, uh, April User, April World. Uh, yeah, we, we spent a bit of money advertising it and drumming up some interest. Uh, and I think there's quite a, a buzz about it. We did all the manuals ourselves. Uh, the manuals were photocopied at Tim's dad's work and uh, <laughs> his mum stapled them all together for us and I mean, that was one of the things that we actually did on time the <laughs> development of the game was, was really, really uh, pushed. Uh, we got into the uh, Evening Telegraph, Dark Evening Telegraph, Hair's Game Blast us off. Uh, that's me there and uh, Tim. Uh, and, uh, I think we made quite like fifty thousand from it. But, uh, we did we did quite well uh, because obviously uh, we owned the entire rights to the game, um, and um, that's not like the show that we went to, but uh, that's the Acorn World Show. Um, and, um, 
So we, we, we had a certain sense of humour about it. We had friends helping us. Uh, one of our friends, um, Todd, uh, we did some of the artwork for it. Um, he, uh, we didn't really suggest this, but he took it on himself to dress up as a monk um, and go around barefoot holding up a sign saying, the end of the world is nigh, by Starfighter 3000. We <laughs> 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 traded around there. Um, and the feeling of being at a show with a stand no bigger than this table, with our computer there, and a box. And the box slowly filled up with money, because we, we had, you know, a customer every few minutes um, before the days of credit cards and so on. I think some people wrote checks, but most people just gave us cash. And this box slowly filled up with cash. And I think we made probably uh, in our freedom of sales, about £7,000 in uh, the two or three days that the show was on. And I remember going back to the hotel room and uh, you know, we were sharing a, a room or whatever. Um, we had a big money fight with all the cash. Two or three days. It was the, the lead up to it, the 18 months, and then two months of complete ridiculous amounts of work. I've never worked harder in my life. Uh, I'm sure the same for Tim. Uh, and then suddenly you're there, and the people, customers are buying it eagerly, giving you money, and putting it in the box. The game was buggy, um, and we did uh, offer a free upgrade or free. Uh, we fixed our problems reasonably, so. <laughs> and uh, that that was um, that was it. Uh, one thing that was particularly good was uh, the, there was a, a company uh, or a, a indie indie grown up. And, and he created some uh, game hacking software that allowed you to cheat, cheat the games. He, he called his company DoggySoft, um, and it was a, a, a program that would run at the same time as your program, but it would allow you to have infinite lives or infinite credit by hacking into the numbers that changed on the game. And I mean, me and Tim knew about this chap, and uh, we, we were determined to beat him. So <laughs> because our um, game code was written quite separately, um, my module, that was my bit and Tim's bit, could both sort of move about and relocate themselves in memory <laughs> and shuffle themselves about a bit. And so we deliberately did this um, to uh, <laughs> sort of make doggy soft uh, <laughs> chat for him, <laughs> hacking our game on the first day. And he, he was, he, I remember coming up to the stand and being really frustrated. His <laughs> 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 um, hacking software couldn't uh, crack our game. I, I'm sure he's probably figured it out and fixed it later, but that was good. Um, <laughs> and then. Um, one thing that uh, led from um, Starfighter uh, 3000 was that um, Arm Limited, um, which had, I think at the time they had broken off from Acorn, um, they got in touch with us completely out of the blue, saying, well, um, we, we like your game, could you possibly do a, a slightly modified version to run in this obscure screen resolution? Uh, and we need you to change this, this, and this. Um, and we didn't understand what this was all about, but um, the chap sounded very serious. And, and um, we said, oh, we'll do it for 50 quid or something. <laughs> um, and he said, oh, no, don't be silly. We need it now. We need it done really well. And we'll give you 2,000 pounds. And it turned out to be probably the most that me and Tim have ever been paid for shortest amount of work in the, it was literally filtering a few bits of the graphics and changing the resolution and we were so familiar with the code, probably did it in half a day. Um, and it turned out that this uh, this chap from Armament was wanting it to do a presentation to Nintendo uh, for the uh, pitch for the arm chip in the Game Boy Advance. And I think there was uh, our game and uh, the Wolfenstein. Um, but 
in a small pay, we help them uh, uh, push their chip out to the gaming world. Uh, what, year, what year was that? That would have been 94. On the school publication? No, no, it's uh, 91 yeah, as well. I don't, yeah, I could, a bit vague yeah. on the detail. Oh, 1991. 20th anniversary of 2011. Uh, happy month. Well, I don't know. The arms probably. It only broke out within that. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't know the exact the company structure, but uh, as far as I. The man from up. Oh, oh, yeah, someone, someone who's from up, whether they, uh, yeah, it, it, it might, you might be right, I'm not sure, yeah. Um, so, but yeah, that, I'd say that was in 94. Um, so, we've done that, we've done it okay. It probably would have been time to get a serious job, uh, except for the fact that there was another company uh, in the Acorn world. Um, or the world of Acorn Games, and they were uh, called Chrysalis. And uh, Chrysalis uh, were a brother and based company. They would do uh, conversions of um, Acorn uh, uh, Amiga games, things like Lemmings and so on, that would be big hits on the, uh, <coughs> the <coughs> machines where they could sell, I suppose, sell more units. So, and the, they, they would get the license to convert them onto the uh, Archimedes. They did quite a lot of these uh, conversions. Um, and because of that, I think they were aware of the Acorn market and they'd seen our game. They, they must have, uh, the, the boss of Chrysalis Software, Tony, um, saw our game and, um, and we didn't really take them seriously. But from the show onwards, I think they must have. Heard, I think they understand that the <coughs> Acorn World Show that we were at, and they were selling their converted lemmings and pipe mania and whatever else they did. Uh, and they offered us a fantastic deal to come and work for them on um, converting Starfighter onto the new home consoles. The new home consoles, in particular, there was the the free year console, which uh, also used an arm chip, so me and Tim were very aware of this, um, and we thought, fantastic, <laughs> we, we, we'll do that. Um, he offered a really generous deal, uh, which was, I believe, at 25% of royalties. Um, but uh, for us to develop free games, um, Starfighter, Three thousand being the first game. <coughs> um, but me and Tim moved up to Rotherham um, to work at Chrysalis um, full time, but as independent as independent developers, um, they um, got a publishing deal fairly quickly with the Freeo company, um, who uh, investor cash rich um, and wanted to uh, you know push the technology of their um, new video console. Um, I remember we even had a, um, a Harvard graduate um, from the 3 video company uh, as a producer who came over to um, oversee me and Tim, which was quite an interesting experience. So, me and Tim were uh, you know, young and um, fly by the seat of your pants kind of programmers and it was this professional Harvard graduate. Uh, one thing I remember in particular is back in the days when we were able to smoke in buildings <laughs> and me and Tim were avid smokers. Um, but because Chrysalis didn't want to impose that on the whole company, they said if people in a particular enclosed office agree to smoke, uh, then you can. And uh, me and Tim were the one of the few offices that uh, agreed to smoke, so uh, we became the smoking den. And the Harvard graduate was very unimpressed because he was all into <laughs> eating yogurt and um, water. <laughs> but we didn't care. <laughs> I'm sure he had some bad memories of that year. We used to love playing games uh, on the um, 
on the Premier console, we played Road Rash, we played for, we went to buy the KFC, which is normally me. Um, we played lots of killer. We still we we're still playing our uh, uh, Stunt Race uh, 2000 uh, spin-off game um, because it was pretty good fun, um, and that's what we were going to do on our next game. Is going to be um, one great thing about uh, Starfighter was you think that the name Starfighter would have been uh, protected as a um, a name for a game by LucasArts. Well, it wasn't. <laughs> but this didn't stop LucasArts trying to challenge it. Um, Starfighter, as you might well know, appears in uh, Star Wars. So I think um, Luke flies a Starfighter, probably. Um, and we just came up with the name because it seemed like an obvious name. Probably subliminally heard it from um, Star Wars. Um, but we came up with the name and used it first as a computer game name. And this was before uh, George Lucas decided to copyright everything, uh, including the name Starfighter. So he challenged the 3DO company, uh, saying you can't use this kind of name Starfighter, but he lost the challenge because um, he had registered it first as a, a name for a game. Um, because back then you could, uh, and as in, as in now, you could, if it's a totally unrelated product, which it kind of was, I suppose, <laughs> it's not Star Wars. Um, so, yeah, uh, we got that. Um, took about a year to write. Um, ridiculous earnings. Uh, the most I've ever earned uh, would have been earned individually over 100,000. Um, because Tony did a brilliant job of selling it to everyone, we turned it around quickly, um, and we had a really good world to deal with him. Um, so, that's me and Tim, looking <laughs> up in Los Angeles <laughs> at the uh, E3 uh, uh, game show. Uh, game that was in 1995, I think. So that was... I suppose, yeah, high point, high point of uh, my gaming career. Uh, and then it all went wrong. <laughs> so we, we had all this uh, Starfighter money uh, from doing on the 3DO, turning it around quickly. And we worked really hard for it. We, were, we lived in the building. Uh, we lived with Christmas. We were, I don't know whether we the first ones in, but we were certainly the last ones out. <laughs> Had keys to the building. Um, yeah. Um, so I think what happened was um, we, let's say, we, we always played this game um, that was called um, Killer on uh, a sub game of Stunt Racer. Um, we thought, that's the best of the maps. And, but we, we left the sort of discipline, I suppose, of working um, at a professional company that have, maybe they, they, perhaps producers weren't around, but yeah, we certainly had a producer on Starfighter. And although, you know, I didn't think anything of it at the time, probably the reason it was turned around in the year was there was a producer saying, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that, do this, only do that, and <clears throat> guiding you from a, an outsider's perspective. And as soon as we were left our own device, <coughs> we just had a programming jolly and just kept coming up with new ideas, never sticking to anything. Um, and a year late, I don't know, it's probably, probably one of the earlier screenshots, one of the few screenshots of the game that we're going to do. Um, and it, we really just lost lost touch. Um, the PlayStation 1 had come out and uh, companies like Signosis were doing things like Wipeouts and real highly polished, high quality games. The, a team of two programmers with an occasional artist just couldn't, couldn't hope to keep up with. Um, we developed this on the Sega Saturn. Uh, I think the only reason we got Sega Saturn was it was cheaper than a PS1 dev kit, 
Um, as I say, we completely lost direction. Um, our approach was, uh, I suppose, a, a, an indie or a bedroom coder uh, approach in a, a world that was becoming more professional by the day. Um, after about a year, suddenly the check stopped coming from Toby at Christmas. <laughs> And we, I think it was, I mean, I was certainly a bit taken back. How could he? Maybe just lost in my own world. Um, but after, after it all ended, um, I carried on for a little bit. I tried to convince Chrysalis to sponsor another game that I developed. Me and Tim stopped working together. Um, not in a horrible way, but in as close to horrible without being horrible as it could be, kind of way. We're still friends, we still go to the same pod. Um, but obviously when you're working so closely with someone, then your business doesn't work out. It's a little bit awkward. But not, not too bad to say. You know. um, so I tried to do this, almost convinced um, Tony. Um, but I think because it had gone from a two-man band to a one-man band, he probably fairly sensibly said, uh, that was uh, the last thing I did on an April Arpedes. Uh, a chap <coughs> uh, got in touch with me, Nathan Atkins, uh, and uh, he said that uh, he, he was a bit of a sort of a, an organiser of people and wanted me to do something from uh, his. So after, yeah, I suppose after um, after everything stopped working, I, I got a job at a local games company uh, called Eurocom, and uh, that was in '98. So I guess my Acorn career was between 1990 up to 95, 94, and then, as I say, that this was something I did in '98, just. Um, just a graphics demo, but there was an idea of turning into a, a car game or something or another. Uh, but when, when you're working full time and I, I started start a family uh, and so on, it's, it's not enough time, not enough uh, um, to you know, get moving on that. <coughs> and another game, this was, yeah, PC, PC game. Uh, so I, I switched allegiances um, from the Acorn and tried to, and I think again I was still trying to convince um, uh, Chrysalis, um, you know, back me, I can do games. This was whilst working um, full time at uh, this company, um, Eurocom Games, where I was, uh, I, 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 it was one thing that I found really was actually getting a career in games. After uh, doing all this indie stuff, and I suppose back then it was still very games programmers were a lot rarer. I think now people can do degrees, and people can, there's lots of people who are self-taught and so on. There's a lot more competition. But back then, uh, in '98, I was offered a job at yeah, at uh, this Eurocom place, and at Rare as well. I turned down the Rare mm. job. Which was probably unfortunate because they read it really, really well. Uh, but then they were a, a longer drive, so I think it was a bit So, uh, yeah, Starfighter. Come on. <laughs> uh, one thing that is amazing me, and I do. I, you know, on the internet, I'm sure, and I Google my own game and so on. And uh, people have taken Starfighter, uh, no names, Chris, and, uh, and uh, you know, taken it, taken it further, taken what I've done all those, well, me and Tim have done it all those years ago, and it just kind of lives on. There's, uh, there's websites and there's uh, people, well, uh, Chris, developing it further and, and understanding what it's just so I, I find it 
hard to imagine how I've done something so complicated myself. Never mind someone else from taking it up and then reassembling it or disassembling it, reassembling it. Uh, it and that, that makes me incredibly proud that uh, yeah, I'm influencing people. Um, there was a, another version that was the oh yeah, yeah magazines were reminiscent about it. Uh, the you know, oh it would be lovely to see game planted. And that, that's a, a version on the, an Acorn Archimedes, which was the, uh, I don't know whether you were involved talking the, the port of the 3DO one. I wasn't, no, I was uh, informed about it, and I was very cross. I was working hard on the Arbus Heavy Man refresh. I had been several months. Yeah. I got an email from, no, actually, I was, I was just in some Nathan Atkinson. Somehow, I think, interactively. It must have been IRC or something like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I might have made some kind of peevish remark. <laughs> <laughs> uh, without any justification. I mean, it's not something that I owned, but, and I, I never have done. I've never been under that illusion. Uh, it's, it's annoying in any field if you feel that other people are. Solving the same problem differently, or you know, duplicating it, and I still get that even as a professional programmer. Like, like one of my colleagues was ranting in the kitchen the other day, saying, "Why won't we talk about this? All these people in the other division of arm would be doing this stuff. We've done it this way." And, yeah. so, I'm trying to get to my age. Oh yeah, I don't care. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, the um, someone yeah took the. 3DO code, uh, Nathan, Nathan. <laughs> and, um, and, and recreate it on a, an arm. I don't know if that's ever got finished. Someone even made a cupcake. <laughs> <laughs> on it. <laughs> this was, um, this was uh, someone who got in touch with me, um, uh, Magnus uh, Anderson, who was writing a book about the history of computer games. And for Somehow he stumbled across my story and well through, uh, yeah through you to Chris oh no that's yeah it. yeah I think yeah Magnus got up through you yes and said I and I guess was a fan you and could be into your hand and made me a cupcake but I actually got a you know proper printed part of that book got a, a page amongst all the thousands of pages dedicated to Tomb Raider and <laughs> all the proper people. Uh, <laughs> But uh, because I think I was one of the um, few contributors who turned up for the launch party, um, they made me a, a Starfighter cupcake. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah, um, made in the UK. Um, I, I think to sum up the feeling I have, and some people say, oh, would you have been better doing it on the Amiga, doing it on the PC, doing it? Well, the Acorn Archimedes and the BBC Micro, the BBC Micro in particular, it was originally an education machine. It was developed to teach children or to inspire people to learn how to work these new machines. Um, and I think the Archimedes followed on that sort of, uh, uh, it's an educational machine. And we're, I'm, reasonably confident that without that kind of mentality behind the original and the existing design of the machine, I would have found it more difficult and probably just got blocked from, you pick up an Amiga and you have to put in a disc to make it go into basic, it's slow, it's not, you switch on a Acorn on Amiga, you can press one of the function keys, and um, you go straight into basic, and uh, from there you had a you know a, a really good basic language. You could also switch into assembler. You could uh, you could really create very quickly some stuff that would feed back and inspire you to create more stuff. And I, I did 
well, during my uh, development on the eight and a half meters, I bought a, a PC, I bought um, a 386, quite expensive. Um, and on the basis that I thought, oh, I don't know, to do on a PC, that's, you know, and it was just so inaccessible. In fact, you, you had a rubbish desktop and had to <laughs> disk in to switch into QBase, and QBase, it wasn't. It was just more difficult to understand an assembly language on a PC compared to on a, an APOM was just ridiculous. It was where would you start? And on a, the ARM chip, the, you know, obviously the name is reducing instructions there. And it was, you could quantify it in half a dozen uh, instructions. And once you understood that, it was incredible what you could imagine how to put together. It was, it was not challenging. There were not hundreds of different versions. There weren't sound cards and graphics cards. So I, I would say that I definitely owe my um, career to um, the Acorn Readies. Um, I think without that, um, I could have just got a computer, learned a little bit, and then played games on it. Uh, that's. Uh, And I, I, I think the other thing, I suppose, is that it was it was more a cottage industry. It was it was you could develop a game, and then you could go to a show and set up a small stand for a small price, and you could you could uh, meet customers directly. And it wasn't like that on the other machines. Um, I, I don't think. Not that I know. <laughs> But I suppose, yeah, it ultimately it was difficult to sustain a, um, a career out of it. And I suppose that's, you know, we wouldn't have been able to, be able to carry on beyond Starfighter on the 8.1 because it was declining at that point. Um, where are we going in? So, I don't know, I still do. Uh, since the um, since the my career switched from being an indie developer to a you know, professional sort of games program, I've worked at some some great companies. I I, I started at Eurocom, and then I got to work for Sega. I got to work for a Disney-owned company, um, and now I work for Microsoft. So it's launched a fantastic career for me. Um, not super brilliant high up, but not certainly a lot better than working in a factory as a brick into where I started. <laughs> um, I, I do love doing, I mean now I, I do audio programming for games, just because it was a kind of a good niche to get into and be left alone to sort of um, just get on with it and not be pestered too much. I do love doing games and um, uh, about three years ago, I worked for Disney, and um, they were having um, trouble justifying the existence of our studio, so they made us all redundant. But they were very generous with their redundancy settlement, and uh, that gave me a few months to uh, tinker around. Um, uh, so I did a, a, a game based on uh, the Starfighter game that I did a long, long time ago, and this was. This runs on a, an Xbox um, indie game platform uh, called XNA, uh, and yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed doing that. But about two hundred quid that to it, but I did finally release it. But I suppose didn't. The problem is doing it as a hobby. You you take it to a point where it's no longer fun, and then. That's it. <laughs> and it was almost like a miracle that I actually put it out there at all because you just, yeah. Um, I've, I've meddled about with Unity uh, now. Um, this is what I'm currently fiddling around with, just doing 3D graphics in Unity. Um, I've really enjoyed, uh, I suppose, taking me back to those very first 
things that um, I used to love doing, which was uh, how you do 3D stuff. Uh, in a way, the technicalities have been taken out of it, but you just find the challenges in a lot of ways. You know, how can I make a uh, smooth, curvy landscape? How can I um, do a shader that changes this color to that color? Um, and uh, so, to round up, uh, I suppose, just talk a little bit about uh, uh, techie stuff, I suppose, but not, not, not for too many. <coughs> so, optimizations. Uh, one of the first things that um, I ever did was an optimization that was quite significant, was uh, learning uh, on chocolate away, <coughs> the original chocolate away, Everything was made out of triangles, so even if it was a, a square, I would make it out of two triangles. Um, and this would have little sort of lines where the two triangles joined, and it wouldn't, so I'd overdraw them, and it wouldn't be as fast. So for the second, as soon as the chocks away, the original game was released, I uh, figured out that you could actually draw shapes with. Uh, many sides you wanted um, and then fill them in in one go. So to fill in a triangle you, you first work out the corners of it and the sides and where they start and end. And then you go horizontally along filling in the solid bit. But if you had to do that twice to make a square and then three times to make a, it, it became um, inefficient. So I, I figured that you could do the coordinates and then do the whole thing as long as it. Um, so by doing this, I actually got the, the sticker, new super smooth, super fast graphics. And the uh, because I released or I told Fourth Dimension about this fairly early on, it actually uh, started re um, remastering or whatever, repopping the discs and then manually putting stickers on the boxes to super smooth graphics. Because it was a significant performance improvement just doing that uh, relatively simple thing. Um, and I think I just, you know, instead of trying, I suppose after I finished the game, suddenly I had time and was keen uh, to sort of go, oh, I always wanted to try that. I think mean, that's going to be much better. And so let them know straight away, and uh, it's a big improvement there. Um, the uh, 3D landscape um, of Starfighter, the big thing that we did uh, was the um, textured landscape on the ground. Now, I don't know, I think this was not particularly optimized late, but it was written in such a way that the entire landscape wrapped around on a 32-bit uh, number, so um, from the far left to the far right and from the far back to the far forward, we automatically roll round back to the start again. Um, so you didn't have to do any limiting bounds checking. Each uh, square on the landscape, the, the landscape will be textured bit is calculated by drawing from left to right along there. Um, but you calculate the sort of the angle that the line would go across the landscape, and then each element, each tile of the landscape was on a, a boundary of uh, uh, two five six probably um, that would uh, automatically. So the whole thing was written to fit within the numbers the machine works in. Sixteen um, by sixteen. Tiles are sixteen by sixteen. Ah. <laughs> 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 what do you do to modern day? What really impressed me was the interaction. If you wanted to store a texture map that large, you would need multiple megabytes of memory. And instead, every tile is looked up, every access for every tile goes through an interaction table. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So that was, that was, yeah, I mean, I would have done uh, the texture bit before. I think Tim did the bit that was the creation of the, the, the editors and the landscape and so on. And uh, so, as far as I remember, it would go from 
the position in real world into position on a tile and then the position on a texture within that tile. Yes, so there's an extra interaction you wouldn't normally have with texture. I don't want how you re-implement this in OpenGL because you know, the effective size of the textures is huge. It's, uh, yeah. it's two to the, it's composite. It's two to the power of eight plus four, so two to the power of twelve, so it's four thousand and ninety six by four thousand and ninety six. Thanks, you can do that in the shade if you want. Yeah, I suppose yeah, a shade is the whole thing. But if you chop it into bits, you could yeah. shade it. Yeah. It would take a huge amount of memory. It would take more memory than you would have in like me. So I was impressed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you could do it in shade there uh, by having a giant tile that was all the little tiles. Yeah, you mm -hmm. you chop your shade off track here. <laughs> I'm going to do one. <laughs> anyway, um, then one of the other things was I could never work out the numbers that you needed to rotate. This whole landscape would rotate in the <coughs> uh, x axis. So you could look down and you could look up. That's x. Well, yeah, depends where your axis is. <laughs> 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 Said why next? I don't think that's in the future. Anyway, so I couldn't work out the um, the scaling of the uh, horizontal. <coughs> so I actually wrote a program to uh, calculate it in brute force. So it would, uh, I think, it would actually just rotate by one degree each time and recalculate the whole line by trial and error. So if you got the line too big, it would make it smaller. If it was too small, it would make it bigger, until it, it honed in on those lines. And so although there's only 128, no, 160 or 320 in its full screen lines, but then that multiplied by the number of degrees I originally wrote this program in basic to do the calculation, and that turned out to be um, too slow, <laughs> like taking days to calculate <laughs> one screen. Right? I, I wrote a, an assembly version of the code to calculate the perspective and the calculation of each line in its different rotations, and then ran that for a couple of hours, and eventually all the numbers that I needed to do a full um, vertical uh, rotation. Um, the um, pixel explosions and starbursts, I think it's all right, this is a bad image, <laughs> but uh, the explosions were made out of um, uh, dots and starbursts and so on. Now, <laughs> these were these were count, these weren't uh, what you do now. Is is you would have an image of a, a pixelate thing, and you would uh, you would scan that image, calculate what pixels from that image go onto the screen. But the explosions here, uh, we did a lot, a, a lot of it by actually um, having custom code that would place each pixel. Now scale them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so rather than uh, having to scan an image with an explosion particle and then calculate where the pixels of that image went on the screen, this would actually be hand coded to go on this. Uh, so I'm not taking bitmaps, I do like that. Sorry? I'm not taking bitmaps, because one of the first things I did was rip out all the graphics. <laughs> yeah. What you're saying rings true. <laughs> yeah, well, it was um, the, to, to render each pixel of an explosion was a sort of, the pixel is along and up by a certain, to which, yeah, it would fire off, I think, yeah, hand code each pixel. Some uh, must have been scaled somewhere, so there must have been an input scale. Um, and uh, yeah, another um, <coughs> optimization that we did on uh, 
on the Starfighter was the um, all graphics are made out of coordinates, um, X, Y, and Z. So anywhere in the world is X, Y, and Z. Um, to move around in the world, um, you can consider it as an X vector that takes you left and right, a uh, Y vector that takes you, uh, in this case, forwards and backwards, and a Z vector that uh, takes you up and down. And each of those vectors are represented by three coordinates, allowing you to rotate the whole system. So um, when it's completely flat, the x might be um, 0, 0, 1, but then as that rotates, it would be something different. Uh, so the graphics for the uh, Starfighter 3000 were done by um, using um, all of the registers, or virtually all of them, to store a, um, a left-right direction, a forwards-backwards direction, and an up-down direction, and a current position. And the um, assembly, the, the code would actually assemble a, um, a, a cube, for instance, would be the start position, and then it would calculate if you wanted to go to this position, there would be a, there was a custom editor uh, made that would allow you to move around <coughs> a, a coordinate and then it would calculate the, or compile the assembly instructions required to move so much to one direction, so much in another direction, so much in another direction. So rather than do um, what you'd have to do in Today's terms, I suppose, you do a, a matrix multiply. You have a, a matrix and you multiply the uh, position, the real position of that by the matrix, which was albeit now insignificant, but back then slightly significant. So the optimization was to, to move the uh, vector um, that was your current coordinate position down the graphs and whatever. And this, this would ultimately amount to uh, nine instructions to uh, up to nine instructions to move to a position. And then sometimes three instructions, you would store out the, the new vertice and you would move to different positions. Um, the, the code was stored as, I think, some kind of numerical instructions, which were then turned into assembly code when the game first started up um, to optimize. <laughs> and it, it, it did work. It, it, it did provide some optimization, some speed improvements. Possibly later machines would have done it better uh, using the, the newer uh, methods available. Um, but we were you know, really pushing, pushing it. And I think that's the end. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Since you <coughs> since you flunked out of um, uh, A level, yeah. do you think you have any disadvantage having not done A level maths or a degree in computer science or a degree in mathematics? Because you would have had to learn all about rotational matrices and transformations and projections yourself. Yes, absolutely. So, I mean, do you regret not having done um, um, a maths or a computer science degree? Well, I, I did A levels, and um, but yes, as you said, it's like the flood. Um, yeah, it, it would have been far easier, but um, I, I'm not an not really an academic. I'm not someone who learns easily. Um, I'm dyslexic, so from an early age, I struggled with reading, got left behind, and got put on this sort of the doesn't know anything table, which they used to have. I, I used to, you know, have to miss a lot of studies to go to basic studies to do um, English. I think it took about five attempts to get an English O level. So it would have helped if I understood what they were saying. But the problem was I didn't. 
I always <coughs> just didn't grasp it, and everyone else did. And so they would teach at the speed that everyone else was learning. And I was just, and, and it was often just because something didn't click. It was just, I, I didn't get it. Uh, I didn't get the first principle of it. And therefore, I get left behind. Um, so yeah, and, and maybe there's a, I think there's a certain stubbornness there as well. Uh, the sort of, uh, I do it myself. I don't know. But it would have, yeah, it would have been advantageous, definitely. Um, but it just wasn't for me the way that things were being taught. Although, um, I think one of the things was that um, I was always steered towards being sort of engineering. So it came to sixth form, and for some reason, uh, sixth form, they had a choice where I could do um, A level computer studies but I couldn't do A-level design. And design was the subject that I had actually done quite well at. I got an O-level grade A in design. Um, and that was a big mistake, because the design teacher at A-level was completely um, whatnot, and didn't get on with him, and I would be far better off doing do studies. Um, and I think I mean, you do pick up stuff, even though I didn't past these um, A levels and whatever, you pick up a bit of stuff and then when you're trying to figure it out and you suddenly go, oh, they sign the side. Yeah, I remember that. You just they were sort of through circles and, and then you, you piece it together a bit. So, um, but yeah, um, I think the, uh, the best thing would be, yeah, someone who knows what they're doing that you can ask, which nowadays is the internet. Yeah, it would have been fantastic if the internet was around when I was first doing it. Do you, do you think the incentives for children today are anything like as effective as they were for you in your day? Um, absolutely. I mean, the, I I was never driven to do it for financial gain. To be honest, I was driven to do it because of curiosity. I was. Um, fascinated by seeing what they could do and um, wanted to do it. I don't uh, really mean incentives in that sense, I meant opportunities, I suppose. But you're talking about an era when um, you know, the incentive was built in to try and find out how to do things. Yeah. And I'm wondering whether nowadays it's, it's actually much more difficult to create that environment for children. Um, you, oh, it's yeah, sure. not, yeah, there's no, yeah, it was a new frontier, so I guess in a way, I mean, I felt like I was one of the few people who was doing this kind of stuff. There were other people doing it, but now, yeah, you are uh, amongst a sea of thousands of people who are also doing it, too. and, yeah, I suppose there's, there's less reward feedback from I've done something that very few people have done. It's very much like oh, I've done something else can do that. So I would say that's that. But I would say on the other side, there's so many different development environments and so much with the internet. There's so much access to uh, forums and if you want to know how to do something. Type it in, and there'll be thousand answers. And it does actually stop you learning how to do it yourself? You can just it copy a bit of code on the website. Yeah. yeah, but then doesn't that mean that you're just taking a shortcut to reading a book and so on? If you copy that person's piece of code, you can modify it to do what you want. In a way, you've understood all you need to know. Uh, I don't understand the first principles of how to create a cosine. I don't understand how to use them, um, and that's what allowed me to sort of do 3D graphics. So, because Euclid or whatever created it hundreds of years ago. So, the internet, yes, you, you are cheating in a way. Uh, you're always cheating, you're always using someone else's stuff. Um, but being able to understand how to manipulate that, um, I think is good. 
but yes, you do get certainly. I mean, I uh, in the games industry, I'm kind of at the right age to have a broad knowledge of the whole business, and that experience helps because uh, the people who are graduating more recently perhaps work in a higher level environment where, as you say, they don't understand how to right what's assembly code, uh, what's a stack, uh, and that kind of lack of knowledge is a disadvantage in some respects. Sorry, I've just often put it in I just checked on Wikipedia about how <laughs> And they were Probably initially, like it was a joint venture between April and Apple and the ESLI technologies. But actually, I now remember that, I've just seen it on Wikipedia. And that was about 1990. I don't know what systems I've had before then, but it would have been within our, within April. But the, that wasn't broken up until 1998, when Arm became you know, completely independent of it. Because that was part of the reason that uh, April and Arm yeah, was finished. Uh, if you remember the history of this, you know, the shareholders, uh, that they yeah. conceived of the profit being made by April. A lot, most of it was coming from Arm. Yeah. Well, these shareholders couldn't get to go down about the computers. Uh, they just wanted the money, so they wanted Arm as a separate completely separate outfit. And, uh, the stockbrokers fixed it up legally, so you know, people weren't taxed and didn't have to sell their shares. I don't know if it's a stunning um, And then obviously, was going to make the separate outfit. That was going to get Yeah, but before that, it was partly owned by Apple. Uh, 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 so I guess, yeah, the people that must have contacted me must have been armed within a division yeah. of the whole company. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I, I didn't know the uh, full cool details of that. Yeah. So with, with Chops away and, and Starfighter 3000, it seems that when you run them on a faster machine, you get a higher frame rate. Mm -hmm. And with Starfighter 3000, it seems to kind of top out. Yeah. Is that the case? And is it maybe to do with the recordings or something? Or is, um, is there, like, yeah, we did. Uh, we frame, frame locked to that. And I don't know why we didn't frame lock the others. Seems, yeah, I think we probably nice. thought the computers will never get faster than this. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just uh, let it run as fast as, yeah, I mean, uh, Starfighter, I think, certainly would run on all the different machines, um, and it would run very badly on the earlier machines, um, but we just let it run as fast as it could. Um, I don't know whether there was a V-Sync uh, lock, the gameplay is the same, you just do more frames in between. Oh no, we certainly didn't do any <coughs> scaling of gameplay movement. I tried to it might not be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I think, yeah, I think we were very much... Um, I've been playing quite, I think quite, yeah, really, uh, as the frame rate drops, it increases the amount of movement per step, and it displays the torches in the corner. I thought, what is this clever? I'm going to try making stuff like to do that, and it doesn't work. And I think the reason it doesn't work is, contrary to my expectations, it doesn't spend most of it time drawing to the screen. It spends most of its time calculating gameplay. So uh, I found that it was one of those things that became, became worse and worse, and the more it tried to compensate, the worse it got. Because it was trying to, the slower it got, the more calculations it was trying to do to calculate the gameplay, and then it gets slower and slower and slower, and basically ran into money. So I, I tried it, and it didn't, didn't work. I'll have a chat with you about that. I'm really surprised. Yeah. As for the frame gameplay, was the major. It's a really complicated game. That's one of the reasons I fell in love with it. Uh, it's not really graphics so much. It's, there's a heck of a lot going on there in terms of the AI, the collision avoidance. That you have these big formations of spaceships attacking one another, deciding who's who hits who and who to fight back against. All this stuff. It's complicated. No. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's actually not playable on the slow machines because it How didn't think you spent on sort of adjust the time scale. Because if you were adjusting the time scale on the slow machine, you know, you'd have one input every half a second, but everything else would move on faster. But when everything else slowed down, it didn't play on the slow machine. Yeah, um, yeah well, I distinctly remember that we wrote in a quite simplistic way in that it would go. 
um, update tick. An update tick is um, read the keyboard or the mouse, um, take those inputs to change the game, move the plane or whatever by a fixed amount, not scale by time at all, um, draw the graphics, uh, repeat. Yeah. And if that repeat was quick, then you would end up with an uncontrollable uh, thing, and if it was slow, you'd have lots of time to think about <laughs> <in> your next <laughs> move. <laughs> Yeah. I, I think it's always had a frame rate limiter, right. but you can set it to max, in which case it's off. And what I did was I recently added a thing which is like a slider at the bottom, and if you run it in the desktop, it will show you how close to the uh, configured frame rate it is. So basically, if the slider is anything other than full, fully black, that means it's running slower than you asked it to run. It doesn't make it unplayable, but it kind of gives you an idea of whether it's running up to speed. I think uh, you were saying about stunt rates. Um, yeah, hours. yeah, that's and that's some basically two thousand and these lock to ten frames a right. second. Yeah, which seems pretty <laughs> low expectations by today's terms. But we thought that was uh, that was good enough, um, and I think it was probably because there was um, yeah this there was the arm free machine, and then and I think yeah. I probably had an arm on machine. <laughs> Um, and yeah, so me and Tim had two very different machines at the time. Um, and his was unplayable, and mine was just about okay. So <laughs> chose to <laughs> tell. <laughs> and uh, I think we even uh, on Sprint Race uh, 2000 we chose a 16 color mode. Uh, we chose mode yeah. nine, possibly um, remember. And uh, to make more colors, we did in pixels and so on. It's probably yeah. didn't really save that much time. Um, why did you use 16 colors? I think there's less memory to move about. Yeah, yeah, that was the, the principle. Mm -hmm. You can be there while you start and dithering things. Uh, colors, <laughs> well, yeah, I suppose if you, yeah, I mean, we certainly could have, um, but if we'd use some of the sort of the drawing technology we got in this, uh, we would have uh, been able to easily compensate for that. One thing that amazes me is that. The, the screen size of the original is um, 320 by 256. I think that's right. And when you see that on a modern PC, it's kind of a tiny little postage stamp <laughs> in the top corner. If you see a 320 by 256 image, you go, oh, that's, that's terribly pixelated. <laughs> and we were uh, doing a whole game today. Um, that's that size. That, that yeah. must be higher, I would thought. By default, 100% is using the eigenfactors of the desktop, so yes, it is two times uh, pixel for pixel. But I wrote a scalar, so you can run it now from the screen mode, and it will scale it to uh, 480 by, by four, no, sorry, 320 by 480. Which is awkward because it's not an exact ratio of the height, and therefore some pixels get stretched and some don't. I still prefer it to having it in a tiny poster stack in the middle of my screen. <laughs> that's quite fun. I wrote some assembly language to do that because it really needs to be fast to do everything. Shifting large amounts of data. <clears throat> Does that have the screen updates on the Raspberry Pi version? Is that an assembly language or is there some. Uh, in the desktop, no, it's using OS Writer. It's only full screen, and the performance is atrocious rendering the desktop, to be honest. It's only just one machine, so hundreds of times faster than you can do it. How, how, right, so how much did you kind of go through the operating system, and how much did you kind of hit the hardware directly when you were doing these games? Because obviously there's the optimization factor, and then it's going to make it run on the new stuff. Um, it's <laughs> very much, you didn't really have to have much to do with the operating system. Um, you would use, I mean, we, for all of these games, I think we use the, um, the basic um, basic language and the assembly um, compiler that was part of that basic language to construct the assembly code. But once it was in the assembly code, it was mostly assembly code. Um, you needed to know the address of the screen. You needed to know I don't know how the sound works, you know, more than me, but you needed to know, I don't know, the sound card address or something. But very little was to do with the operating system. It was 
largely uh, constructed into a almost standalone a piece of assembly language. Right. Um, with the earlier games, things like uh, uh, Chocks Away especially, it would skip into basic quite a lot. So a lot of the mission screens and so on would be uh, done in basic using crawl sprites and whatever. Um, but by the time we got to this, this whole thing was there were, there were two modules, there was my module, there was Tim's module, and they were just solid assembler with a bit of communication between them. Um, myself, I never had anything to do with the operating system in terms right. of how the game ran, and Tim must have done something to get probably the address of the screen and the sound card and the mouse and the yeah. joypad input, not joypad, the keyboard inputs and um, stuff like that. Very, yeah. very small amount, just the bare minimum, um, unlike you would today. Today you would totally, you know, embrace whatever the hardware and the software were offering you. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, back then it was proper coder <laughs> and stuff. One question, you mentioned the killer game in Stuntbase. Yeah. That sold a lot of this you to me and my brother as to who would buy the KFC in it. <laughs> yeah. And did you yeah. ever consider implementing that in, in Starfighter or something similar to that? Um, yeah, well, we thought it was a great idea, but I think, um, yeah, with Starfighter we just didn't, we focused totally on this kind of, we're just driven by almost uh, an obsession with making it single player spectacular sort of thing. So we didn't, we didn't think of uh, split screen. Because we, it, you, you mentioned with um, some linked computers with a, uh, a serial link and play against each other on the separate machines. And I remember at, um, I was at school at the time, we had the two other meetings in the school linked up to each other by homemade serial things. We placed uh, stunt rates against each other and kill them. Yeah. Great fun. But, uh, but the teachers thought that much. <laughs> <laughs> no, we didn't, we, yeah, we didn't do that. Um, and I suppose we, we could have done, and I don't honestly know why, because we would have had the code and the tech and so on. I think this, this um, and I, I suppose this kind of was, in a way, why we didn't, you know, succeed. Because we, we got, fell into the trap that a lot of people, a lot of companies do, which is make it shiny. And although it doesn't look shiny in today's terms, <laughs> back then, this was make it shiny. And that was our overall obsession, was to, uh, we, almost, we, we probably neglected gameplay. I would say that this was, in terms of fun, we, it was kind of, it's, it's hard to say, but I would say, you know, it's it not, it not really that much difference from chocks away, but just oodles of more work and shinier looking. Um, and I suppose that was our um, driving force. And I think maybe, as you say, we, we would, um, it would have served us well to have done a serial inversion and created something that was a bit more fun because it, 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 people enjoyed it, uh, but maybe it was more skewed towards being a bit of a shiny thing rather than all this type of fun. Um, you have to take your pitch somewhere, <laughs> and we certainly went on the that side. Uh, and it just Yes, that's true. Yeah, I mean, as, as it was, it was, yeah. yeah it was, it's full on trying to, yeah, trying to squeeze everything out of the machine and trying to, um, yeah. I'm bursting with questions, I want to bore everyone. So, <laughs> uh, I might allow myself one. Um, 
the, the two files that I spent most time well, basically rewrote were uh, the conditions detection and the summation that just had the ground objects. So really annoyed the hell out of me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so the AI is now a lot better. And I still get a kick out of that because you know I'll be chasing an enemy spacecraft and it's going around the hill and it's not crashing into it. Or it's chasing me and it's going around the hill and not crashing into it. Um, and also the sound. So I thought the sound's kind of flat, so I made it do stereo sound. I'm wondering, had you had more time, what would you have improved? Um, another 108 missions. <laughs> <laughs> I think, yeah, uh, more time would have certainly been, it would have been good to have finished all the missions and then played them through without altering the underlying code with the exception of bug fixes, instead of doing it the other way, which was to try and bug fix whilst finishing missions. So potentially <laughs> half the missions finished, fix a bug, and we broke in half the missions. Um, because we just didn't have, there was no capacity to test it. So I, I think it would have been gameplay, I think it would have been an important thing. Like you mentioned with the zero link and so on, um, split screen would have been great. Um, yeah, I think gameplay would probably be the thing that I would have said was missing on it. Uh, and, I mean, I yeah, I'm going to have to talk to you about this. <laughs> Slow down with calculations, but um, yeah, there, there was, we were certainly trying to make the uh, things like the, I don't know, if you smooth this out, because they used to be all jittery. Um, um, there was yes, that, that was really weird. There was uh, code to smooth it, but yeah. it was deactivated somehow. Uh, <coughs> there were a lot of features of it that kind of uh, looked as though they'd been written by you, but they never worked. And I was like, oh, this is good. <laughs> it's a shiny thing. So I, I remember the, yeah, the things like this, when they would lock onto a target, and they would just go like, <laughs> <laughs> You wrote the code to fix that, and I like, can't understand why you haven't turned it on. The trouble is, it's hard to fix one of these things retrospectively because I was terrified of breaking gameplay. And that's why there's now a configuration dialog box where you can just choose all the options. Which bugs you have? One thing really surprised me apparently, the big ships have internally a counter for missiles and they're allowed to. Big ships are allowed to launch missiles. I've never seen a big ship launch a missile in my life. It's why I've played this game for years. And, uh, I just looked at the code, and there it was, just one instruction was wrong. And that was the only reason big ships can't knock the missile. Well, so you make them incredibly difficult. The trouble is, once you fix these bugs, you then have to go and play all the missions again and realize, <laughs> well, we didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't either. In your profession, obviously. <laughs> yeah. Um, were you aware of these bugs? And, you know, you just thought, well, it's not that important. We had literally no time. We we were we promised that we'd set ourselves ridiculous targets, and um, we just worked as hard as we could. Um, honestly, 20-hour full-on days, four hours sleep, taking turns, wake each other up getting shouted at by the person who just woke up, getting <laughs> all four hours sleep, and then shouting at them to wake up. And this went on for a couple of months. And if we, if we weren't so young, we would just have gone to sign It was just sheer, almost, we'd, we'd, we'd set a target too high, and, um, had to push it out there. Um, and we did our best to tidy it up a bit later. But then we got up and then we got the contract with Rob um, and Christmas. And I suppose we moved on. Um, I can understand that. I was just I'm curious when you were at the show, were you thinking, I'm sure I remember writing the code for XYZ and somehow it's not working? Oh, it was delirious. <laughs> 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 we, we probably honestly thought it was a reasonable, a lot of the problems we actually found out from the people who bought it and can't do this, can't do that. Because we just, we didn't have time to test it. We were, we were trying to fix things, 
and we would just take a, 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 a like you said, you know, you can reluct to change something because it might break everything. We had to change other things um, and we couldn't we test it on times. <laughs> we didn't. Um, and we, we took the uh, educate I mean we probably fixed um, fifty things and then broke fifty other things. Um, who knows? But there was just not the yeah, not the time to do that. We, uh, I mean, I suppose the other thing was retrospectively what we've done would be make it less ambitious, make it 30 missions, but good missions that work rather than underneath that half of them didn't. And then after you, you get remembered before you do badly. And so, yeah, that was. I think to most people nowadays, writing an entire program and sending like which is more ambitious than they would ever do in their lifetime. And it amazes me that you're able to do that. You must have been just so focused that I, even I find hard to imagine. Yeah, yeah well, we were certainly in the zone. <laughs> <laughs> Everything that people take for granted that compilers do for us, doing it yourself, like, what was the last thing in this register? Do I have to preserve a token's function for all this stuff? Yeah. What goes to my mind? <laughs> it, 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 it surprises me now, because studying like, like yourself, I'm uh, you know, in the, well, I don't know about itself, but I, I certainly work in higher level languages where it's, uh, the, you can have long names for all your different uh, yeah. variables and it's it's very easy to follow. You can take someone else's stuff and follow it. And yeah, I find it staggering what we did. <laughs> I, find, I find it more staggering that you understood it. <laughs> <laughs> it's very hard to maintain the focus. You can't just make space for things like you would in a C program. People talk dribble nowadays about C being like a high level assembler. It really is because you want to add something for a struct to C. You just add a new declaration, a new member to the declaration of the struct. If you want to do that in assembly language, you need to find every single piece of code that references that structure and change the options. It's just, uh, yeah, we, we, we do a lot of stuff in on paper, and we would, yeah, our structures would be written down. Never change and so on. And stuff to uh, the wall, or no? We I think we have a little notebook. Yeah, I remember the uh, between the two modules, mine and Tim's, there was a communication structure that was I don't know 200 numbers that were written down. And I think we both had our notebooks and we just biro in these numbers. Number 28 was the this address. I do, I remember on, um, I think it was Stunray's set, I somehow couldn't count in intervals of four, <laughs> and got, got it slightly wrong and ended up with an interval of two, halfway through one of these giant structures. And like you say, it was, um, it kind of worked because, I don't know, it was bites and it somehow, but I ended up with this uh, mistake, hard coded throughout the structure of, all the different things that would use this structure, um, yeah, um, and could change it or could alter it. <coughs> so it ended up being uh, halfway down the, the big structure in this country. So it was misaligned by two bytes, and I just had to accept that. <laughs> and I think corrected it later on. Uh, there are definitely things, weird things in the file format from the start when I was documenting. You described it partially earlier. I mean, not just the way that polygonal objects are specified, but there's stuff like in my notes it says you add on seven here. No reason. Just <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, it was, a, it was a miracle that it worked in a way. But I do seem to remember it was a reasonably stable program. I don't think it don't think it crashed that often. The only reason we didn't crash was because zero page wasn't protected. And as soon as RISC-OS came, 4 came along and protected zero page against... Oh, we're writing zero. Privacy and reading from zero page. <laughs> <laughs> How often? Um, every game, Luke. You know, yes, many, many times every game. <laughs> 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 so, lots of, lots of debug. Oh, I remember it not. Much, but, uh, I suppose. <laughs> 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 yeah. uh, fond of memories of its stability. <laughs>
All the games of that era are like that. You know, if you look at Duke Nukem 3D, which is a completely different kind of game with a completely different background, yeah. you can't run that on a modern PC for the same reason. It's just until memory protection got better, people simply didn't manage to stay close. Yeah, that's pretty good. Mm -hmm. but you, know, you would have thought you'd have written a feature yeah, that is doing something, and instead of doing what it should do, it's leading to very rare. But you don't notice that the only effect is the sun spaceship on one of the 100 and eight yeah, missions doesn't those. launch a missile. It's <laughs> <laughs> leading from zero. Maybe it depends on the operating system you've got installed, what the gameplay is like. <laughs> I'm very unfit with the schedule. Start having fun and then you were in my life. <laughs> <laughs> it's a legitimate tactic when being followed by several enemy aircraft. Fly round and round a hill <laughs> <laughs> until the dodgy collision detection takes them out. Or is that? Is that yeah. slightly too deep? I think that's one of the things that is a, a very difficult problem to solve, and we didn't do it particularly well back then. Uh, but I think it's probably, in a way, you, you, you play new games now, and there are certain tactics that are kind of questionable. But, I mean, I, I, I bought myself a PS4 and I love playing Destiny um, on it. And the best tactic is to hide low and they all shoot and miss you or hit something. And you find a sweet spot where they can't shoot you, but you can shoot them. And um, you win. And it's, it's, yeah, it is, it is a legitimate tactic. <laughs> in yeah. yesterday's terms, as much as today's terms, but yeah, um, it's, it, it, certain things are incredibly difficult. Unless you keep your gameplay very controlled and simple, uh, it's, you have to accept that people will find, I suppose, these these ways of making it easier. As they're part of the game. And, yeah, they are part of the game, but they're not really, are they? As you said, it would be an ideal world as clever as you are, and you wouldn't stand a chance when there's more than one of them. <laughs> but I suppose the fact that you can fly low and have just crash into things is... Um, it's it's almost... Yeah, yeah. yeah, but it's almost part of, it's almost part of the expectation. Um, you can get the many games you can play, modern games that are developed on million, million pound budgets uh, will have certain um, yeah, ways of cheating the AI, if you like. Yeah. I tried making the, um, the planes, well, the spaceships in this game, shoot straight up, well, shoot better, they, I made them do deflection shooting. And I had to take it out again, it was no fun. Basically, you just be flying on, you get blown up, because <laughs> you know, a computer is always better than a human, especially yeah. within this kind of environment. And so I took out the white diversity theorem. Uh, and suddenly it was all fun again. <laughs> I suppose you, you kind of want to make it perfect and then engineer uh, imperfections yeah. thereafter. Um, but yeah, in, in, in terms of yeah, making a, a, an AI as good as a human, that's, I think that's a long way off even, even for the big budget games. Uh, they're always not quite. <laughs> Not quite there. It's a bit reassuring, really. <laughs> <laughs> because they all take over the world once they know to do that. <laughs> well, that's it, no. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's it. Thank you again for coming.